Welcome back, everyone, to the show, to the Brawl in the Family podcast, which uh, may or may not be getting a new name soon. Am I correct, Chris? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, I've kind of shortened the title on the uh, YouTube channel to Bitcast. The Brawl in the Family podcast takes up a lot of space, so, uh, you know, I wanted something a little more uh, catchy, a little more... Uh... Something that has a better feel on your mouth. Man, this is... Already we're off to a weird start. Mm-hmm. So that's my cohort and uh, co-host, Chris Seward. Yep, and you are Matthew Toronto. Yep. We're here to talk about some video games. Oh, yes. Uh, that we've never talked about before in our entire lives. Certainly not. No. This is certainly not the third time we're recording this podcast. No, that would be so silly. <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're celebrating an anniversary of one of our favorite games. A game that Chris and I both agree is, is, a, is a stone-cold classic. Absolutely. You may have heard of it. It's called Super Mario 64, and it came out September 29th, 1996. I'd say this was a very formative experience in gaming for me. I grew up with the Super Nintendo. I had some friends that had the regular Nintendo, but uh, I did. I only got the Super Nintendo when it came out. Yeah, when the 64 came out, then you were kind of... This was your first real hyped-up console launch since yeah. you started playing games. Yeah, that, that was the first time that I experienced what we would call hype. Uh, you know, when you oh, get yes. really excited and you look forward to something and you, you dream about this new experience that's coming up. And, uh, and man, well, I, I dreamed, I literally had dreams about the N64. I would, like, think about it all the <laughs> time and how this is, like, going to be such an incredible experience. You gotta uh, love that hype. Well, I, I'm kind of overhyped these days. I'm a kind of little crusty old jaded <laughs> jerk. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah but, but back then I was all, you know, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and... Uh, yeah, this came out on your birthday, no less. It did, yeah. It came out on my birthday, September 29th, uh, 1995? 96. Six, excuse me. So you, you had turned, uh, what, like 11, 10, 12? Uh, yeah, I was 11 at that point. 11th birthday. And uh, I'd followed Ooh. ever, like, back then, you know, this was before really the internet was a thing. Uh, so you followed games through magazines, primarily. Mm. You'd learn about new games through friends, through magazines, and through stores. So you'd go to like a Blockbuster or a Toys R Us or a, a game store, and like they had Funko Land back then. Uh, they had Babbage's. Uh, <laughs> Babbage's. Yeah, electronic Boutique was a thing, but it, it wasn't EB Games. It was Electronic Boutique. Yeah. Um, and GameStop came up later. Um, but yeah, so like you, there were very few avenues to get information on new games. So uh, when you, you learning something new was like, oh wow, it's like this this secret information that you've discovered. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. like everyone in the world knows it because it's on the internet. So when did you when did you first uh, get the real exposure to Mario sixty? Uh, the first time I played it was at a blockbuster on Segan Lane in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I, I I remember I got to spend uh, 20, 30 minutes there just playing Mario 64, and it was on bob on Battlefield, uh, and that was, it, it felt like an epiphany. Uh, it was this completely new world, new type of gameplay, new type of experience that I couldn't imagine. It lived up to my incredibly high expectations, which very few games do. They really did usher in the whole 3D uh, gameplay element. There, there had been a few 3D games before then, you know, polygonal games. Yep. But that was the one that really nailed all the aspects of it. You know, you had free roaming movement, you had really tight controls, you had uh, a very smart camera, actually, for the yep. time. And I mean, that was that was all pretty revolutionary. And it was kind of wrapped in that whole Nintendo charm. You had the Koji Kondo soundtrack, you had the whole Miyamoto approach to gameplay first. It was just, uh, it was really the full package. One thing that really spoke to me about the game is how the, its levels and its challenges are designed in a very open way. Like, I could have spent hours just running around the castle courtyard, uh, not even going into the castle, you know? You just climbing up the trees and jumping around the map, and you can go swimming, you can kind of try to, oh, maybe I can jump across this thing if I time it just right or if I do the right angle. Like, the controls gave you so much power that everything else was just kind of incidental like I think Mario 64 is a good lesson in game design because it, it shows how by giving the player um, powerful tools of movement and control um, you can make lots of things fun uh, if those core yeah. elements aren't, aren't that fun then you know the, all the pretty graphics in the world won't you know make your game uh, a good time yeah and I, I also think it was great how they sort of introduced you to this world because basically Mario shows up and Lacky flies in and says hey here's how you control the camera and that's about it, you know? If you go into the castle, Bowser will say, I've, I've cleaned up the stars, and there's your narrative. But for the most part, you can just kind of run around and explore the whole feel of the game at your own pace. 
Uh, the courtyard is a safe haven. We can sort of run around and jump and do a little mild platforming and just get a great feel for things before you even have to go on your first level. But it's not forced on you, right. you know? So it's a, it's a really smart way of just incorporating those gameplay elements without uh, getting bogged down in tutorial type stuff. Yeah, th there was a sense of discovery about the game that I really liked. Uh, you, you could, you know, you, you would see an objective and it, there wasn't just one direct line to getting it. Maybe you could do a triple jump up the wall, then do a wall kick and get up to the platform. Or maybe yeah. you could go around the side and uh, do like a running backflip or something. And most challenges in the game, there were multiple ways to get there. Like in Bob on Battlefield, to getting to the top of the mountain, there's like, I don't know, three or four different ways just I can think of off the top of my head where you can get there. Yeah. Um, you can run up the, the, the basic way, or mm -hmm. you can teleport up there, or you can get the wing cap, or you can shoot yourself up there with a cannon. Yeah, and there's like that slope on the side where you can you can kind of like crawl up it, I think, or you can like do these like weird long jumps <laughs> to like, get up it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it like kind of slips backwards. But on the other right. side, you can just kind of you can you have to run around, but there's like other big uh, cannonballs that are falling at you. I really liked the openness to the game, and after that game, uh, the Mario series got a bit more linear. Uh, I kind of lost some of that exploration, which uh, always kind of disappointed me. Yeah, I, I think that one of the nice things about a, a great 3D platformer is that if, if it's designed well, it comes with those inherent uh, op multiple options to get around. Mm -hmm. Because you have to design your environments in 3D, which means whichever route the player takes, it has to be interesting. So that's something that's that's really cool about uh, Super Mario 64 and some other uh, exploration-based 3D platformers, like uh, Banjo Kazooie would be one. Um, and I, I think that's an element that uh, that not everybody gets. So cool to see it, you know, in pretty much the first 3D platformer out there. Yeah, Banjo Kazooie is a good example as well. That that's probably one of my top three 3D platformers, or top five definitely. Um, and for that same reason, it's it has a good open-ended design to it, similar to Mario 64. Probably more yeah. similar than any other 3D platformer now that I think about it. Mm, maybe so. Uh, you said the Mario series kind of went off uh, in a more linear direction. They did have one more uh, open-world sort of non-linear approach, which was uh, Super Mario Sunshine. Yeah. Which uh, had generally pretty good level design, but I think it had other issues. Like yeah. How it, we talked about how Mario 64 you in a very cool way into the world but Mario Sunshine doesn't do that as well. no it's got this big long uh, cutscene like the first seven minutes of the game aside from like a few seconds when you fight on the, the airstrip on the airstrip aside from that it's a big long cutscene with cheesy dialogue and voice acting <laughs> and uh, the graphics aren't really great and the characterization is really weird yeah Peach comes off as being really ditzy and dumb yeah Peach in these games not all of these games obviously but but it seemed around the time of Mario Sunshine Peach sort of had this kind of blank expression, and her voice was always kind of lilt upward. Like, yeah. Mario, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, it's like she barely has any sort of personality. She's kind of always in this deep. Yeah, like she barely understands what's going on. Like, <laughs> like at the end when uh, she's talking to Bowser, she's like, oh, she's like, I'm your mama. <laughs> she says that to Bowser Jr. when Bowser Jr. calls her mama, and it's supposed to be like. You know, disbelief. Like, you no, know, obviously she doesn't really think that, but the way it's delivered, it makes her sound like she's kind of confused. Like, maybe this is a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> but she has given birth to this spiky turtle thing. Well, you know, but maybe she actually knows that she didn't, but she's just playing dumb and she's like trying to scheme another way out, you know? I don't know if they thought that far ahead. <laughs> it's Sometimes like, oh, I, I gotta play dumb for these turtles and then I'm gonna find a way out of here. <laughs> I think I think Bowser's voice was pretty funny in that game. Yeah, they he, never really yeah. brought back his his human voice. I mean, they they show that he talks in Paper Mario and stuff, but they never actually had him actually talk again. But it was kind of funny. He's like, the water's great, hey Junior. <laughs> kind of had this sort of weird, uh, your uncle, your friend's uncle's voice. Yeah, you know? yeah, and you know that's the approach that I think would have worked well if it was consistently delivered throughout the game. Like if all the characters had that kind of kind of funny, over the top. Cheesy, but well characterized. Yeah, like how Rare would do something. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I feel like they did it. They did it right for Bowser, but the rest of the characters it came off as just kind of, kind of poorly done. I'm afraid. Yeah. So after Sunshine, we got the uh, the Galaxy games, which I, I think are terrific. I mean, they were really well received, but they weren't quite the same style of gameplay as Mario 64. They were uh, a little bit more like the Sunshine Void levels, uh, kind of taken to the extreme. Yeah. Which I think is perfectly fine, but uh, you know it's it, it does make me feel like it, it'd be nice to go back to that Mario 64 style of play as well, especially since 3D platformers are so rare these days. 
No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, but the uh, the second uh, oops, oh, there there is a there is ukulele. Ukulele, yeah, that's gonna. Yeah, that's we weren't we weren't we weren't planning on going into talking about ukulele. Yeah, I'm sure uh, I'll have plenty to say about ukulele in a future podcast. But uh, so far, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, I, I watched a video of the uh, recent test area that they released to backers. Uh, it looks pretty good. I mean, I think they're they're definitely coming along with the mechanics, and uh, I think it's something to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Uh, but the Galaxy 2 was more like what you're saying in terms of uh, like those void levels from Mario Sunshine as a full game. Uh, Galaxy, two, Galaxy, Galaxy, Galaxy 2 was a little more linear than 1. Yeah, and I liked, I liked 1 a bit better, probably... Largely for that reason, that uh, the areas were a little more open in general. There were there were some areas where they were a little bigger, and you could you know go to a different star if you wanted to. Yeah. So you said you uh, first saw Mario sixty four in a in a blockbuster. Yes. I was first exposed to it from a Nintendo Power VHS cassette, tape, <laughs> which they would send out to subscribers uh, periodically. I, I think they had a like a Star Fox sixty four one. Yeah, that's the one I had. Where uh, they these uh, these Sony and Sega guys kidnap Mario, and they're like. <laughs> They're torturing him to try to get information out of him about the I have that pack. Mario toy, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like a kind of a weird-looking Mario. <laughs> Doesn't he have, like, red overalls? Yeah, it was yeah. it was made around the time of Mario 2, I think. It's <laughs> kind of a vintage. But, yep. yeah, uh, they, they're kind of like... They remind me of the bumbling sort of burglars, like in Home Alone or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was Sony and, and... Who are they? Sony and Sega? Yeah. Was Sony around it? Yeah, they were around there. Sony yeah. and Sega. And yeah, anyway, uh, they had that, and they had a Donkey Kong sixty four one, but and they had a Banjo Kazooie one, which I thought was great because uh, John Lovitz, John Lovitz, John Lovitz <laughs> narrated it. Bubble Gloop's mom join <laughs> Banjo and Kazooie on an adventure to defeat the evil witch Gruntilda. Crazy. <laughs> and now, now at the tech park, every now and then we'll just like yell out <laughs> a Banjo Kazooie level name in, in his voice. Mumbo's Mountain, which is kind of one of the things we do now. I can see why. So, uh, so anyway, there was a Mario 64 tape, and I remember seeing, you know, the game through that. They said, oh, it's 3D, you can go everywhere, and they had, you know, Mario's face pop up. It's me, Mario! And uh, I just thought it looked really cool, but I was I was a little worried at first, because I grew up on the NES, so I wasn't really the biggest fan of arcade analog sticks. Oh. So when they kept hyping up this analog stick on the N64, I was kind of like, uh, I don't know if I want this. Because previously, my only exposure to those things had been either in arcades or from third-party controllers that friends would have. Uh-huh. You know, like they would have an NES uh, giant The joystick thing. thing, yeah. Yeah, it may have actually been a first-party controller, now that I think about it. The NES Advantage or something. Huh. But I remember it, it wasn't built for these games, you know? You try to play, like, Dragon Warrior on it or, like, Mega Man, and it just feels kind of funky. Yeah. You know, compared to that, that tactile feel of a D-pad. Well, what... But, of, of course, I think that the analog stick for Mario 64 worked really well. Yeah, uh, there's one big difference in the mechanics of that. Uh, like the joysticks that you get on an arcade machine or uh, probably that old NES one, uh, those are probably digital. Yeah. With analog, there's a constant gradation between 0 and 100, basically. So like, you know, so you can slightly tilt it in a direction and you get a, yeah. you get a slight increase in control. Old joysticks or ones in arcades are pretty much like on and off, you know? So it's like mm-hmm. you press right and you go right. There's no in-between. Uh, you can't go, like, slightly right. Yeah, that's definitely true, but uh, 11-year-old me did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the first time I ever gripped that N64 controller, I'll never forget it. Like, that's that's number one in my memory in terms of game controls. But it, my experience, like, grabbing a game controller, that was probably number one. Number two was gripping the GameCube controller, which I still oh, yeah. think is really an ergonomic controller and feels really great in your hands. I tried that at, like, this, uh, there's, like, a Nintendo event in L.A. Was that... Is it the Cube Club? Yeah, the Cube Club, yeah. Cube Club! Yep, I got to play uh, Luigi's Mansion and a couple of the games. Um, yeah, Monkey Ball. Yeah, Monkey Ball. Monkey Ball's good. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, Mario 64 was the perfect game to introduce the world to the analog stick because it felt so natural and uh, just gave you such a good connection with Mario in that game that I can't imagine playing it any other way. Really, I mean, any 3D platformer now, like not to not have an analog stick in a 3D platformer sounds like torture well um, it's funny you mentioned that because mario 64 itself had a ds remake where you could not use the analog yeah stick, which is a shame because it's otherwise uh it's a very nice remake it actually in a lot of ways looks better than the original and it has i think like 30 more stars or something yeah but without that super intuitive method of control it just does not feel as fun yeah i i was pretty disappointed by that uh well i thought it was okay when it came out i guess but it definitely was missing a big component of what made Mario 64 so good in 
just by, just for through the controls. So I think that's actually a great example of how the controls on their own played such a huge role in uh, the gameplay experience. Yeah. What's kind of weird is that I didn't actually have the, the best initial experience of Mario 64 because I had played it at a friend's house. And it was like me and my older brother and his friend, you know? Yeah. And they were older than me, so they got to play it first. And then when it was my turn to play, it was in the middle of the level Dire Dire Docks, I think, no. where you're on platforms and, like, they have these moving sort of poles on things and you're above water. Yeah. So I'm trying to navigate this thing that's just, like, level 9 in the game. And you're supposed to have built these skills already. Right. And I'm messing, fiddling with this joystick, not knowing what I'm doing. So it was, I played it for, like, five minutes, you know, before my turn was up because my brother and his friend were older. Yeah. So uh, it, it was it was kind of like, well, that was something, you know, but once I finally got to start the game from the beginning and go through it the normal way, and actually get the hang of things, I loved it. That was perfect. So that said, uh, I have a, a, a small kind of gripe with this game that keeps it just below, like, the top Mario game for me, yeah. which would be, um, I feel like it's not quite Mario-y enough. I, I mean, there there are a lot of elements in there that, are, that remind me of the games, but I, I feel like uh, a great deal of what had been established about the NES and the Super NES games had just kind of been discarded. Um, for instance, I mean, the whole linear progression was 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 part of it, but also just the power-ups in general. You know, there's no mushroom, there's no fire flower, or leaf. There's not really Yoshi. You know, he makes a little cameo, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you can't really use him. And even things like uh, Koopa Troopas, you know, only show up like two or three times in the game. So I, I kind of miss some of those elements. Yeah, that didn't bother me so much uh, because I, I really enjoyed Mario games my whole life. I, you know, I play. I remember playing Super Mario Brothers in the arcade. Um, no, I remember playing Super Mario Brothers at the laundromat uh, with <laughs> my. Whenever my mom would take us to the laundromat, she'd be picking up clothes or whatever. I'd get a quarter and I'd get to play Super Mario Brothers on the arcade machine there for you know a couple minutes. Uh, <laughs> and I, I remember loving Super Mario World and Super Mario World Two. Uh, I didn't play a lot of the NES ones at the time because I didn't have one. <laughs> My friend had Mario is Missing, which uh, <laughs> it wasn't a great experience. But I mean, I was super psyched for Mario 64. So I, but the thing is, I wasn't super attached to the like the brand in terms of like the running themes and running imagery in the series. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's it's kind of interesting getting a separate perspective. Yeah, I was completely inundated with Mario as a kid. Yeah. When I watched the show, I had these w giant wall stickers on my room and that cheats. <laughs> yeah, I remember watching the show a bit, uh, uh, but, I mean, not a ton, but, uh, like, so, especially because in, like, Mario World and Mario World 2 are pretty different from each other, but they're also, yeah. like, they don't have a lot of the stuff that was in, like, Mario 3, for example. Mario 3 has a lot of, like, stuff that has carried on into the present day in various that's true. ways. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, Mario 6, Super Mario World kind of discarded, um, some of the power-ups that Mario threw, like the suits, it felt like Mario yeah. threw was really taking Mario in the direction of suits. And then uh, Mario World kind of discarded that entirely and went with Yoshi yeah. as kind of the, uh, the replacement for the suits. So you're right, there were definitely um, some elements that got dropped between games. Yeah, I think Yoshi was the main thing that I was like, oh, there's no Yoshi. But uh, everything else I didn't really care. Like, I, I, I guess I sort of was like, oh, you can't have, there's no Fire Flower, which is a little... But that was it. So, like, those two things were the only thing that even crossed my mind is something that would have been cool. W which things did you miss more significantly? Well, I feel like a lot of the uh, the enemies and stuff kind of have their own character. And yeah. I would have liked to see a few more familiar faces. There was, um, you get Goombas and you get Boos and there's bob Um But I guess I, I kind of missed a lot of the other uh, enemies that had, like, there were no Koopalings. There was no, I guess, like, Luigi... I mean, obviously he's not an enemy, but you know, yeah. it's one of one of the one of the established parts of the whole Mario universe, you know. And I think uh, some of the environments, I feel like this was probably a side effect of, of just having a an early uh, 3D game, but the environments didn't feel particularly Mario-ish to me. Oh, okay. Were that many uh, like mushroom platforms or like kind of familiar brick roads or not that many blocks in general? Yeah. I mean, this this is kind of a nitpick altogether because I still think it's it's a it's a great game. It's just one of the elements I think uh, I had kind of missed as a kid. I see, I see. So, what would you say uh, your favorite stage might be? I, I liked Bob on Battlefield a lot. I think it's a, a pretty diverse stage with uh, you get a lot of exploration. 
Um, yeah. I, I think I wasn't as big a fan of some of the stages where there's a lot of bottomless pits, like uh, the Thwomp's Fortress. Um, <laughs> so it, that feels more limited to me. Um, so I liked the more open right. version of uh, Bob on Battlefield. Um, I, I did like... Um, I like the booze booze castle. Yeah, big booze haunt. Yeah, big booze haunt. That was that was it was spooky and uh sur- like a lot of the game is kind of surreal and spooky, you know. But uh yeah. I, that level kind of freaked me out a little bit. Not to mention all the water areas which I was terrified by like that eel. Uh, yeah, let's talk about let's talk about that for a bit oof. because Mario 64 like I just said it, it didn't have very many environments that felt Mario-y and I mean it kind of went further than that. They had a lot of really surreal kind of weird environments. And Partly because of the whole, you know, early 3D thing, but maybe just, I don't know if it was the design aspect or what, but uh, like you said, that eel was, I mean, that was crazy. It was terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. There was there was that floating uh, aquarium right right outside of oh, Delaware. Oh, yeah, Bay. yeah, yeah. You would go in there and you have to get eight red coins, but you're just floating in, in the sky in this enclosed glass box that's filled with water. Yeah. The only way out getting, getting uh, you know, eight red coins and Mario's losing his breath the whole time. Right, I think that's a really interesting aspect of this. Where, where it's like, like Mario's having a nightmare. Yeah, like what is this place? This, <laughs> <laughs> who made this? What is this castle? Yeah, and, and I, a similar aspect is like a, a lot of levels are just floating in nothingness. It's kind of scary, but it's also kind of fascinating. And there's this element of wonder to it uh, because, from from a technical perspective. Obviously, these are just technical limitations that they worked into yeah. the game. Like, what is an invisible wall? You know, what, what's why is it that if you uh, fly around at the wing cap, uh, that hill over there, you can kind of look over it and it's just blue nothingness below it. Uh, mm-hmm. Things like that that are just limitations of the from a technical side of things become mystical or surreal element of the game. Like, I, I remember trying to get behind the waterfall. In the castle courtyard. Yeah, in the castle courtyard, because there were like rumors. Oh, if you get behind the waterfall, you can actually ride Yoshi, or like there's something like that. You start to pay close attention to all these details of the game, which probably the designers didn't even think about. Like they're just designing this area based on the technical limitations that they're working with. But things like invisible walls and elements all the of floating things. Yeah, the floating the elements of the of the environment that that seem surreal in some way. You, you focus on them a lot and you're like trying to figure things out that what are, what are the secrets here how can I explore this further yeah it's kind of eerie and mysterious and not really in an overt way you know it's not like Resident Evil this is this is kind of freaky it's yeah kind of weird now well that said the uh, the Big Boo's Haunt was kind of a strange design choice because I remember the uh, the textures were like really gritty for that level yeah and kind of dark and the music was like <laughs> you know, yeah. and then the basement yeah. had like uh, had this weird dichotomous like carnival music. And that was that was kind of a strange level. Ed. Yeah, yeah, but I liked it. It, it was it was yeah. very unique. Uh, what was your favorite level? Um, I think I like Tiny Huge Island the best. That's a good one. A lot of, lot of fun a, stars. Yeah, I thought it had a cool gimmick. Uh, I like seeing Wiggler again, and um. I remember like going to the, the the huge island first, and then going to the tiny island and stomping around, just feeling like a giant. Yeah. Like yeah. recognizing certain el- areas and stuff. That was another really surreal moment for me. Yeah. Oh, you know what else was cool? The uh, I, I didn't like. I'm not the biggest fan of Wet Dry World, but I love the the town area in the corner. Yeah, the flooded town. Yeah. I always think flooded areas are just really fascinating. So that was that was a part that was really exciting to me. Yeah, I agree. Like, I... What's the history here? What happened? Here? <laughs> And I want I, I really love that element of the game, and I wonder how much of that is just because we were young and uh, impressionable, or and how there was nothing else like it. Yeah, or how much like because nowadays when I play a game like say Mario Galaxy Two, I really don't get that sort of feeling with the levels. I, I feel like everything's kind of or like 3D Mar- uh, Mario 3D Land or um, uh, I don't know if you play some other like mainstream games like Uncharted or some shooters or something like why is it that those games feel like their worlds are more discreet and less there's less wonder to the world there's less like oh here's this empty this like flooded town and that brings all these questions I guess what I'm wondering is how much of that is just us reminiscing and how much of it is really a design element of Mario 64 yeah that's kind of the uh, video game version of the nature versus nurture yeah yeah kind of I don't know. I, I, it might be a little bit of both. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to disassociate ourselves from our own experiences, I guess. I get, but, but that's I, true. I wonder what other people feel about, um, like, say, younger gamers. Yeah. Who first played 
maybe Mario Galaxy or Mario Sunshine, and then played Mario 64 later, like what their own opinions would be. So, readers, I mean listeners, whoever, <laughs> uh, that'd actually be a good topic for you to uh, chime in on in our comments section, because uh, we're actually pretty curious about that. If you played a game before a Mario game before Mario 64, and then played Mario 64 later, do you still feel like Mario 64 had that kind of surreal, uh, mysterious feel to it compared to the Mario game you played first? I feel like part of it is a design factor because a lot of things in the game are just kind of there, mm -hmm. and when when something is there without an explicit explanation. I think that helps the mind to wonder and to come up with their own explanation for it. Like, remember the star in the courtyard near Boo's, uh, Boo's haunt? And like, oh, is this like, the Ella's real thing? Yeah, Ella's real. What is this <laughs> secret, you know, sign? This is crazy. What is this mystery? And yeah. so people invent this whole thing because it's, they, they, there's this thing here with no explanation and it seems mm -hmm. it seems kind of cryptic and so people are like oh uh, there's got to be something here and, and and like Mario Sunshine there was a secret book you know secret book yep yeah that's right it, it's things that the game doesn't even really draw attention to either yeah no it's, it just happens to be there and I wonder if part of it is that a lot of more modern games uh, maybe they just tie up loose ends a little more cleanly they're like okay we're not using this so we remove it or yeah. uh, er okay, everything we need in this level is here, so that's it. So like, well, we're not going to pay you to design this extra area, uh, or the uh, an mm -hmm. area that's bigger than necessary, mm -hmm. just to be a little more mysterious. No, everything's so focused in modern games. I don't know if they're afraid of having a more open-ended experience, but having those details, those broader environmental experiences, seems to be kind of lost in a lot of modern games. I'd say it's probably a combination of that and just the prevalence of the internet today. Yep. How you can sort of just look up any question you have and pretty much get an answer right away. That's an interesting point, but if you look at speedrunning, for example, mm -hmm. games can still be mysterious and fascinating in this way where new things are constantly being discovered. Mm. The Zelda games are a great example. There's always people finding new ways to figure out the mechanics in the games to a really ridiculously precise degree. In the Wind Waker, Underwater Hyrule, mm -hmm. there's like a big barrier that you can't get through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's like been a source of fascination with the community for a long time. Like, how exactly does it work? Is there any way to get through it? And mm -hmm. um, so you have people that are constantly trying to figure out how to get through it. So they've recently actually come up with some uh, theories on how to actually do that, which uh, would be really amazing. And I think, I think for me, that still has some of the magic in what we're talking about with Mario 64, where it's like, oh, there's this thing that seems mysterious. How do we explore it? How do we figure it out? Like, I think the internet's actually helped with, with the speedrunning community in certain games like the Zelda series, um, it, it's actually helped build that sort of community, which uh, is really fascinated by new discoveries. And it, they come up with mysteries of their own. Like, it's so it, it's more based towards speedrunning, like how do we get through this faster? But it, that's usually based on finding out a new way to do things that you never thought you could have done before. Yeah, like skipping past certain parts. Things. Yeah, yeah. Taking shortcuts. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. The games that I'm most interested in are ones that tend to make good speedruns because they have worlds that are complex enough and have enough like exploration in them to make that interesting like a Zelda game. Well, speaking of that, actually, that reminds me of my experience with Link's Awakening, which has uh, that really infamous screen skipping glitch. Yeah. Yep. Only, in, only in the original cartridge, not in the, uh, the Game Boy Color remake or the uh, Virtual Console version. Um, but yeah, you press select at, at the edge of the screen to go to, to open your map, and then when you press it, you know, press it again to exit your map, you're on the edge of the next screen, mm -hmm. which opens up all sorts of crazy possibilities. And I remember just kind of exploring the game by doing that, and it felt like a new way to play the game that was really fun because I, I didn't know what was around every corner, I didn't know how the world's connected, <laughs> and it was just a really good experience. Although, um, I guess I should warn people that if they try that on their cartridge, it may mess up their save files so just you know take caution with that can it mess up other save files too uh or just I the think, one that you're doing i think it can actually mess up the battery itself oh gee. if you do it too much wow which is kind of the ultimate save file <laughs> but um well you, you can replace the batteries though you can yeah i mean that's 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 possible it was just i remember that being a really cool experience and yeah. i would i would suggest it to anyone who has the original cart for uh link's awakening even though it might mess up your battery <laughs> All right, so uh, back to Mario 64. We were talking about how Mario 64 has this kind of open-ended kind of approach. I'm trying to think of 2D games that would have that equivalent. And the best mm -hmm. I could come up with was uh, Little Nemo. Oh, yeah. The Dream Master, which is, uh, yeah, an NES game made by Capcom. It's, it's actually very good. 
it's a platformer, and it, it's got like eight stages or so. And while you go through the stages in, you know, linear order, the way you go through the stages is kind of cool. They have five keys that you need to get, for, you know, to open the lock at the end of the stage. Mm -hmm. And each key is sort of tied into kind of a more minor task. Like one key would be uh, up a tree, you'd have to avoid all these falling pollen things that hurt you. You have to get the help of a gorilla to go up a tree and get it. Another one would be you have to get the help of a lizard to dig underground and go through this other kind of obstacle course thing. And uh, that kind of reminded me of the stars in Mario 64, where each you have uh, these larger areas with these kind of smaller tasks that reward you with the stars. Right. It kind of felt like, uh, yeah, like, a little bit like Little Nemo in 3D. It sounds like that, that is some game design that was much ahead of its time. Uh, I've never played a, a game that's, you know, that old that uh, had that sort of gameplay. So I, I'm actually interested to play it. That sounds like a pretty good experience. It's good. The main gimmick of Little Nemo is that you're throwing candy mm. at various enemies, and some of them will uh, befriend you once you once you throw enough candy at them. So you pretty much jump into them and wear their skin as a suit, I Whoa. guess, <laughs> and gain those abilities. It's a little bit like Kirby, actually, oh, okay. now I think about it. Yeah. So you'll find an enemy, and you'll, you'll jump into him, and you'll be the frog Little Nemo, and you'll be able to jump higher. Or you'll be Gorilla Little Nemo, and you're riding a gorilla's back and climb trees and stuff. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it, it's good. It's uh, yeah, it's made by Capcom. It's based off the uh, pseudo-American, pseudo-Japanese mm -hmm. uh, animated film from, like, the early 90s. It's fun. This design concept applies to other genres, too, um, like GoldenEye, for example. Uh, I thought GoldenEye was very innovative. Uh, Gold GoldenEye 007 on the N N64 uh, mm -hmm. had pretty open-ended levels. Uh, you had various mission objectives to complete, um, which would re require some like exploration and searching yeah. around the levels. And I don't think any single level was really uh, linear, where you just go down a corridor shooting people. Mm -hmm. And Perfect Dark also did this uh, in similar fashion. But every game since then, like, they remade GoldenEye for the Wii, but they kind of redesigned a lot of it to be more linear with less ex exploration. I wonder why all of these genres are kind of slimming down on the exploration, on the open-endedness. I, I think I would suspect that the producers or someone in the chain of command at the game developers are saying, well, we're running into a problem where we have a lot of players who either can't figure something out or they get confused or lost or missing a lot of stuff that we put in there and we want to make sure that everyone can experience it, which seems to me has kind of led to this outpouring of, like, roller coaster games. Uh, by that I mean, like, like Uncharted or um, games like that where you're pretty much going from point A to point B or, like, uh, The Last of Us, or there's a lot of games like this where it's very cinematic. Uh, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of character interaction, uh, and but all the action kind of takes place in a very linear fashion. Like you, you go, you're just walking from point A to point B, and you're gonna get into a fight, and you're gonna either fight him or maybe you can sneak past him or something. But there's very little option to the player as to where they're going and what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and not that those games are bad, but I feel like that seems to be the more common approach these days to games because I think when you're investing that much money in a game, especially, you're like, oh well, we don't want all, we don't want players to just walk by this thing we spend a million dollars on, like this this scene that's like really. I don't know, a lot of explosions and fancy stuff in the scene. Like, what if they just walk by and miss it? Like, what, what's the point? So, I, I guess that's part of it, but by forcing the player to, like, not miss anything, <laughs> that kind of cheapens the experience. Like, it's, it's less of a rich experience to me. I feel less like I'm exploring and discovering things and more like the the, develop, the game is just shoving it in my face. Like, hey, here's this next thing. Here's the thing. And a lot of the optional things in these games are just, like, little collectibles which are meaningless and I don't feel really rewarded to find when it's just okay I have to break all the boxes in this room to find <laughs> the, the stupid stuff you know I think it kind of depends on the on the type of game it is because I feel like with with the platformers they kind of kept getting more and more collecty yeah yeah you know until it sort of reached a breaking point and everyone was tired of them but they were tired of the collectibles. They were tired of having of having collectibles shoved down their throats. Yeah. I don't think they were tired of the exploration and the uh, the platforming itself. Okay, that's true. The open ended three D platformer has been kind of uh, kind of a no show lately. Yeah. Um. Even even with Mario himself, you know, who's who's kind of old reliable when it comes to platformers, uh, the Mario games have been gradually getting more linear. Um. Since I guess Galaxy Two and then Three D Land and then Three D World. And, you know, not to mention the new Super Mario Brothers series. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I do like me a nice, just tight experience for a game, you know? That's something that's super focused and knows what it wants and doesn't have the fluff. Because we've criticized games with a lot of fluff before. Oh, yeah. A lot of filler, a lot of fluff. 
But I guess what you're saying is is less about focusing on what works with the game and and more on like focusing too much on cinematic elements and things that take control from the player and don't really matter as much. Yeah, yeah, I think that that can kind of lead into our next topic of less is more. When these older games could do things more simply and be more effective, whereas the newer games are kind of cramming all these extra things in there and kind of losing some of the magic. Well, part of it comes to graphics in general. Like, uh-huh. as graphics improve, the expectation for that improves as well. Well, not improves, but <laughs> the expectation gets higher as well. Right. I was going to, for our next bit bits, talk about the Zero Escape series, which I had been playing over the summer and uh, ended up really enjoying overall. But uh, the third game in particular sort of moves away from the visual novel format established in the first two games into something more cinematic that kind of goes past the developer's own budget to where it ends up looking, uh, you know, kind of cheesy and takes away a lot of the uh, correct emotion and feel of, of scenarios that would have worked just fine with the cinematic format. Yeah, so so basically, if you'd just been reading the text and seeing like a still image, your mind could have imagined things much more vividly and more you'd have a more of a connection with the events rather than seeing kind of a cheesy 3D model kind of clumsily animated through like a, <laughs> a scene. Is that a- accurate? Yeah, to give it a little baseline for uh, players that haven't that haven't experienced these games, uh, the first two games are kind of like the Phoenix Wright series, where when you're talking to someone, you know, it shows uh, a sprite animation of them, or in the second game, a, uh, a 3D animation of them, kind of going through, I don't know, maybe ten or so different uh, stock animations that they that they have, and you know, their mouths are moving and such, and. I think when you when you have something like this, it works. It works fine for this game. It works fine for Phoenix Wright because you're not picturing these really awkward animations and stuff. When you move on to the third game, uh, the you know the budget just can't quite support the level of detail they want these characters to do. Like if they're throwing a punch or if they're running from room to room, it doesn't look as nice as something with a much higher budget. So it ends up detracting from that, and it, it really all kind of ties into the uncanny valley. Thing. Yeah. You know, the more realistic you get with your characters and with your animations, uh, the more people are going to notice if the slightest thing is off. Exactly. Yeah, the, the more stylized it is, the easier it's going to be to convey what you're trying to convey. Uh, that's why something like animated features can work. They have very mm-hmm. simplified detail on a person's face. You know, they have exaggerated features like the eyes might be big and the nose are yeah. small. Or from a psychological standpoint, when you when you look at someone else, your eyes are subconsciously scanning their face for cues as to what they're emotionally experiencing and what they're conveying to you. And um, by reducing those elements, you can make it pretty easy to get a consistent emotional read on a fictional character. But when you have something that looks really realistic, it just raises the bar for what the developer has to do to, to sell that experience. And if they don't do it great, then it's like you're, you're actually getting a, a worse experience, even though they invested a lot more money trying to make the, the graphics like photorealistic. Because, you know, even if in a still screenshot, it looks really good. That means you have to animate it to look like a real person, which that's really hard. Even if you motion capture a real person, it can still look fake. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of like one of my favorite games, uh, Final Fantasy 3 or 6. Mm-hmm. You're one of those people. Uh, wait, wait, I thought you were one of those people now. You, you've been saying it. You've I've been never it been six. one of those people. You've called I'm it 6. Never, I will never relent. Uh. I call it 6. I call it 6 for everyone else's benefit, but not my own. It kills me <laughs> a little bit inside every time I say Final Fantasy 6. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> the game, the game with Kefka and Esper and Kara in them. Whenever, whenever they, uh, they'll have dialogue. You know, they'll they'll say something and they'll sort of slowly nod their head, in kind of a sad way, or they'll do a kind of a shocked expression. Your mind is gonna fill in those expressions with the best possible quality uh, of of scenario there is, and your mind is gonna read their dialogue in the best possible quality of voice. You know, you're not gonna read something in bad voice acting. Right. There, there are far less hurdles to, to, to cover once you have uh, something that simplified. And I guess this is pretty much what you were just saying, but sometimes less is more. The human mind is constantly filling in the gaps of information that it's taking in. As you're uh, doing, just going about your day, um, you're, you're constantly making assumptions about things. And when you see a box of crackers on the shelf, you can assume all these things about that box of crackers without actually you know, opening it up and looking at the crackers inside um, because your mind is filling in those gaps for you. The same goes for art and animation. Um, you don't have to see 
the fully animated expression on a character to get what they're going for. So like in Final Fantasy VI, <coughs> <laughs> basically a lot of the animations are just a single frame uh, to change the sprite to look like it's shocked or something. And a lot of the time, there's no expression at all. Like the character's just standing there with a flat expression. Um, and all you can really see, like since it's kind of pixelated, you see like the really big eyes. Large eyes, yeah. yeah. And like the hair and stuff. So you don't even see much of a facial expression. But just by reading the text and hearing the music and taking in the atmosphere of the scene, you can build a coherent emotional template for the scene. It doesn't take voice acting. It doesn't take fancy 3D graphics or anything like that. Your suspension of disbelief is much harder to shatter because there's less to shatter it with. Uh, but yeah. once you bring in the voice acting and the cinematic graphics and um, all this other stuff, uh, it's much easier to do something that's going to be, uh, that, that just looks wrong, that looks off. Your mind can't smooth it over. When it's more rudimentary graphics, you're automatically filling in the gaps. But when you can't, when those gaps are gone, when it's like, okay, there's a fully animated emotion here on this character's face, but it looks wrong. And that can shatter the experience for you when, it, if they had something more simple, it actually would work better. Yeah. Can I bring up Final Fantasy X here? Oh, yes. Yes, please do. So is it, uh, Final Fantasy X is the first Final Fantasy game that has a voice actor, as far as I know. First one in the main yep, yep. stream, mainline series. And the main character, uh, Titus, or Titus, I guess. Uh, we're going to call him Titus. It's, it's, Titus yeah, yeah, let's stupid. go with that. <laughs> it's, it's a good reason to go against canon <laughs> yeah, in any so. situation. Yep. All right. So, so Titus, um, he's talking to his friend Yuna about, um, I believe the conversation is, is kind of about whenever he... Is faced with difficulty, he kind of laughs in the face of it. And he demonstrates this by laughing kind of like this. <laughs> and so this laughing scene has become kind of an infamous uh, scene, you know, for, for Final Fantasy fans because it, it's it's so kind of awkward. And I mean I understand what's going on here. He's not supposed to sound entirely genuine. But it just does not really work when you hear it like that. Now, I, I have a theory that if this was done with like sprites and done with like text boxes the way they used to do, yep. it'd be it'd be it'd be fine. It'd be pretty good. It'd be like, okay, these guys, you know, this is how he copes. This is this coping mechanism, and you wouldn't have that crazy sound going on in your head that uh, him laughing. So, voice actor for Titus made a video and he talked about this. He said that uh, the point is that they're forcing them to laugh in a forced like awkward way because it's really hopeless situation and they just desperately want to smile um and like that's yeah. okay like that makes sense for the scene but that is not what comes across in the scene crumbs across the scene is like sounds really cheesy and like i, I don't like these characters i want them to stop talking i want the scene <laughs> to be over it, it, it's not all the like I, I wouldn't even put that all on the voice actor part of it i think is the direction of that scene like the way that the cinematics are cut in Final Fantasy X, I don't think is very good. It's kind of slow and plotting and doesn't feel natural. And the animations of the characters don't help either because it's kind of, you know, it's kind of rudimentary PS2 graphics. So there's really all these all these different factors that yeah. you have to suddenly worry about that you wouldn't have to in a 2D. Right, for instance, facial expressions are pretty rudimentary in Final Fantasy X. Um, there's not a lot of detail with the eye movements and like all the muscles in the face where, you know, in a more modern day 3D graphics, uh, they do more with those other facial animations, but the faces in Final Fantasy X, as I'm recalling it, are pretty flat. Like, yeah, the mouths will move a little bit when, when people talk, and they'll, but the bodies will move. Like, you know, he's like, got his hands on his hips, and he's like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> But all these other elements don't sell it. On paper, yeah, okay, I get the scene, but it doesn't work because of all these details that just aren't quite right. And I completely agree that if this was in Final Fantasy VI, <clears throat> then uh, it would have worked just fine. Hmm. <laughs> what if you laugh like that? <laughs> I think that would be an improvement. I just laugh to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yuna does it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I always thought Titus... Um, remember Animaniacs? They had the good feathers. Oh, uh, yeah, sounds. yeah. I always thought Titus sounded like the the one of the good feathers squid. <laughs> like especially when he narrates, like, ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a blitzball player. <laughs> Me and Bobby and Pesto. <laughs> it's, it's his voice it sounded a lot like that, uh, it's like supposed to be a I don't know if it's it's like a Jack Nicholson or something. Yeah, yeah. I say. Yep. Yeah. So anyway. I think that yeah, would have been better if uh <laughs> would have been better if they, they directed they it were, like a good feathers segment. 
<laughs> they were running around town. Yep. Super Mario Sunshine is a great example of how less can be more because you look at Mario 64 and, you know, the cutscenes in that game are very minimal, very minimal dialogue. Pretty much all you get is a couple text boxes at the beginning with the lack of two. You talk to, like, the rabbit at one point for a few seconds. Uh, you, you can flip through these dialogue boxes really quick if you want to. Uh, you know, you talk to Bowser a couple times and, like, that's it. You know, you're not locked in these cutscenes for seven minutes like the beginning of Mario Sunshine, and the game's better for it. I think they didn't know what tone to give a Mario game's cutscenes. Yes, yes, that's a good that's point. My, that's my theory, you know? They, they didn't, like, go funny with it. They didn't really go adventurous and exciting with it. It was just kind of this weird sort of... Master Mario, you please go down to the surface and see what's going bothering Princess Toadstool. And they're like, we challenge you, Mario, you making a mess... It's just boring. I don't know. It's it's weird. They, they didn't get the right feel for what they wanted to do. Yeah. I think the Galaxy games really improved on that. Even oh, yeah. though they, they, they weren't really cutscene heavy either. But they felt very competently shot. They felt kind of grandiose, which was nice. You know, and it wasn't mm-hmm. like melodramatic, you know. It was like the short thing happening at the beginning. Trouble comes down. You know, here comes Bowser. He kidnaps the princess. And... It, it, it felt it felt fitting for the series. As I recall, there were fewer cutscenes, like fewer cutscenes where you're kind of locked into watching stuff happen in Galaxy compared to Sunshine, right? I don't think it was voice acted for for starters. I think it was more text boxes, yeah, kind of go yeah. more at your own pace. And uh, although it, it, I remember it taking kind of a while to get the rabbits at the beginning. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. But after that, you're uh, you're pretty much you're on your way. Yeah, but Sunshine has a number of times where you're kind of watching a cutscene uh, for you know a couple minutes. Which uh, seemed unnecessary to me, because, uh, like you said, they didn't get the style really down quite right, and but yeah. but Galaxy really did. And I, what I liked about Galaxy is a lot of the story stuff was kind of optional, um, and it was good too. Like the stuff with Rosalina's uh, storybook. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I, I had some issues with like I thought it was kind of silly how every time like Mario walks in, he's like, <gasps> and he's like he's like accidentally <laughs> walking into this storyline, so he's he's like kind of <laughs> eavesdropping, which is kind of weird. Yeah, he's like, oh, hey, bro, what's over here? Oh, hi. Yeah. But with, she's, uh, but, she's just reading. Yeah. yeah, but the story itself I thought was pretty good and the nice yeah. music and nice art. So, you know, and having that as like an optional thing, I thought was was cool. So if someone yeah. cares. It would, it would have been cool. I mean, I get the idea was uh, to kind of come across Rosalina being kind of like a mother to these these yeah. Lumas and reading to them. It would have just been nice if she was just, you know, sitting there and you could talk to her and then get the story. Yeah, yeah. Instead of having to do it automatically. Whatever. Still a good game. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I might say that's my favorite Mario game. No, wait. I take that back. My second favorite Mario game. Speaking of Mario games, what is your favorite Mario game? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of your favorite Mario games, what is it? <laughs> my favorite Mario game is Super Mario Brothers. Mm. Gotta, gotta give it props. If that is your favorite Mario game... Uh, well, we're really talking about 3D Mario games, so... Matthew, oh, okay. I would like you to rank all the 3D Mario games right now. Go. Oh, Okay. <laughs> At gunpoint. Uh, let's see. There've been what five or six of them. Okay. Let me. Let me. Let me. Okay. Number six would be uh, Super Mario 3D World. No wait. No, not 3D World. What am I saying? Hang on. <laughs> Number six would be Super Mario Sunshine, which was still pretty good, I thought. But it's it's the one that I really haven't really gone back to replay much, because not just for like the kind of weirdness that we talked about, but also because I felt like a lot of stars were filler. There were some yeah. really great ones yep. that were like, you know, you explore the world at your own pace or you go into those void worlds, which are really fun. But there were also an abnormal number of uh, red coin ones, which have always, I mean, let's be honest, the red coin ones aren't as good. And blue coin ones in this one, too. And blue coin ones. The blue coin ones were kind of a pain. Yeah. Because you stumble upon these blue coins and you trade in like 10 or whatever for for a star. And it's like, okay, that's, that's fine. Eventually you get to the point, though, where you're at like 115 shines. And you're you're missing these scattered blue coins, and you have to go in specific missions and specific levels, and like shoot at the moon in one of them. Yeah. And they're like super obscure. And um, there's every level has a has a mission where you just chase Shadow Mario and spray him with water, and you get a star. And it's kind of fillery, you know. So I, I would say there's like maybe 70 really good stars in there. So that's why Mario Sunshine would be uh, probably last on my list. One of the problems with the red coins in that game was that. I, I kind of liked the red coin levels in Mario 64 because that was an opportunity to just kind of explore the level, you know? It was like, since the game was more fun to explore, there were two kind of, you might call them filler stars in Mario 64. You had the red red coins and you had 100 coins, 100 coins. in each in Which each I would level. usually go for at the same time. Yeah, because you, you can get it both at the same time. And it's like, so one big exploration run. 
which is yeah. which was fun. But the levels in Super Mario Sunshine weren't really as fun to explore. And so, and not only did they have those red, red the red coins, they had all blue coin ones too. So it started to feel pretty, you know, tiresome. They, I remember they had multiple red coins per per stage too. Oh, did they? Jeez, I don't even remember that. But I don't know if I would say they were actually less fun to explore. I thought they were pretty good. There were just like half of them, which I yeah, thought was yeah. kind of an issue. Um, so after that, I would say maybe 3D World, which was good. You know, it, it was it was fun. It, it didn't stick with me as much as uh, a lot of the Mario games. I feel like. 3D Land was was a very solid 3DS game, but then taking that to a, a whole like home console thing, it, it kind of felt like a step back from Galaxy One and Two. Did, you said you played it with your family at one point, uh, but it, yeah. it didn't really catch with them. Like it wasn't a good casual game, you wouldn't say. Um, I mean, just based on my kind of limited experience, it it was okay, but it wasn't really. I mean, they didn't play more than a couple levels with me. Uh, okay. If I twisted their arm, they would play more. But I mean, it wasn't like. Uh, I would say even New Super Mario Brothers Wii had a, a fair amount of people playing it pretty regularly. Yep. Um, but overall, I would I would say this is better than New Super Mario Brothers. Um, I, I thought it still has that EAD Tokyo polish. It's got the orchestrated music. In this case, jazz music, which was really good. Um, and the levels are fun. It just uh, it was a little less memorable. Hmm. Right after that would be 3D Land, which I thought was uh, probably the best handheld Mario game. Um, the best. Not much more to say about it. Better than uh, best what? handheld Mario game. Yeah. Super Mario Land. Yeah, that was kind of weird. Super Mario Land. <laughs> don't you remember? Don't you remember that Mario Land is a weird comic I made? Yeah. The, oh, what the heck? <laughs> Princess Daisy, your kingdom is cuckoo bananas. Yeah, he's kind of had a checkered uh, past on the handheld side. He had, he had the weirdly named advanced titles like Super Mario oh, Advance yeah. Four, Super Mario Brothers Three, or whatever. That's such an awkward title. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that, I mean, Mario Land, Mario Land was fine. It was it was like a, an introduction to the Game Boy. It was cool because it was Mario on the go, but it was it was also extremely weird. Yeah. Uh, Mario Land Two, I had recently replayed a few years ago, and that's it's held up pretty well. But it actually feels very simple compared to almost all the other Mario platformers. Yeah, okay. It, um, feels more simple than I remember. It's pretty cool though. You go into space. Hmm. Uh, okay, so where was I? I was at five four six five four. All right, so number three. This is when we start getting into like the. The ones I really like. Uh, number three, I'd say, is Galaxy 2, mm-hmm. uh, which I thought was just all around terrific. Uh, I kind of missed some of the exploration elements, but I also appreciate the streamlining. And it had a freaking great soundtrack, like top 10 of all time. Number two would be, yeah, I would say Mario 64 is number two for reasons we've already illustrated here. And uh, my favorite 3D Mario game would be uh, Super Mario Galaxy, which had also an amazing soundtrack, but. Um, you know, had that newness factor, and it really felt like a an evolution of platforming. Hmm. Wow, that's that's quite a good list. You know, I there there was only one other one time I've ever agreed with you, Matthew. That was when you said that Zelda <laughs> at E three looked pretty good, and I'm like, yeah, I guess it looks pretty good. That's the <laughs> only time I've ever agreed with you. That was the only time, right there. Until now. Until now. Until now. I agree like with that, that list. list. That is a good that list. list. Yep. One of these days, yep. we need to talk about the Galaxy games. Yeah, I th- we should. Because I, I feel like I think this is the first Mario game we've talked about in the podcast. Yep. Plus you count Mario Kart, which we don't. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, we're fine on Mario Kart. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, Mario 64, great game. Go go, go play it. Go celebrate 20 years of uh, of Charles Martinet. Mm-hmm. Although technically he was he was in like a PC Mario game before that. But whatever. Yeah, that you know, doesn't really count. Was that like, whatever. wait, was that Mario Teaches Typing? Mario Teaches Typing. Yeah, yeah he talked a lot in that too. You go watch some cutscenes like that. He's... <laughs> chatters up a storm yeah so for why did they do that today um i wasn't really planning on anything because i think actually i'm pretty cool with nintendo right now i'm less cool with the flooding in louisiana which has been a huge problem yeah why did they do that i mention that (laughs) why did they do that yeah but uh but for uh for nintendo yeah no real problems next time around i will have played more some ace attorney ace attorney six and some dragon quest seven little six and seven Six and seven for you. That's pretty good. Man, I've been playing so much Dragon Quest lately this whole year. I just want to talk about Dragon Quest all the time. I joined the Dragon Quest forum. Ooh. Dragon Quest forum. Dragon Quest. I like it, man. It's good. Good. You might not like it. No, I think I would. I, I want to play him, actually. But uh, you didn't You didn't like Luffy too very much. Yeah, that's because that's that's it wasn't Quest. very good. <laughs> that's because it wasn't very good. Nice. <laughs> there are two types of storytelling in RPGs. One oh. is kind of episodic. One is like throughout the whole game. Right. Final Fantasy is kind of the latter, and Dragon Quest is kind of the former. Hmm. So other episodic games would be 
Mario RPG, Paper Mario, Earthbound, First Mother, and like Final Fantasy is more like you know these characters, you learn about their backstories and stuff, and you have kind of this one main storyline. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense to you? That That's good. Sense. Yeah, so so uh, it's it's a little different than Final Fantasy, but it's I feel like it's so much more reliable. Like, mm. Final Fantasy just has gotten just... It's so cheesy now. It's so overwrought and melodramatic and stuff. So Dragon Quest is kind of feels feels fresh. All right. Well, next time, uh, are we going to Paper Mario next time, or should we wait until like? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, Paper Mario doesn't come out until October. Okay. So next time we'll talk about something else. All right. Well, thanks for joining us again, everybody. Don't forget to leave your comments about whether Mario sixty four was mysterious and scary to you or not. Yeah, especially the underwater sections. Or, that or was, if we we're just the only one that were freaked was, out by the eel and the giant water piano. Was and scary. Water was really scary. I didn't like the water. I I love watery things because it's like I don't know it's just like a cool atmosphere when you like you go under the water and you see like a civilization you yeah know? but it's just spooky because it's all the stuff you don't know like you can't see all that far into it and it's yeah, really, that's like dark and scary it's all the uh, it's the, the, the scary part is how it's unknown it's oh, the, yeah. like oh i don't know what's behind there or and, and your controls are limited so like you're not yeah, as, yeah, yeah. you feel more vulnerable it's just scary yeah all right, well, tell us about water in the comments then. Yep, please do. And, uh, yeah, at the end of the, uh, the Rio Olympics, you know, which just concluded this past yeah. week, they, uh, they said, okay, and, and next, next year, I, I, I didn't watch it live. I don't know if they said next year or whatever, but mm. they showed that it's going to go to Tokyo for 2020. Mm. And to prepare the audience for this, uh, I guess the, the nation of Japan had prepared this video gamey hype video. I was <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe two minutes long of all these uh, Japanese athletes swimming about and kicking and doing all this crazy stuff interspersed with like Japan imagery. Like one was like Hello Kitty, one was uh, some anime. And at the end, the prime minister of Japan, uh, he's in his limo and he's like, oh, I'm never going to make it in time to the Rio Olympics. So he puts on a Mario hat and it turns into Mario. (laughs) So then Mario's running through. Yeah, you got to go watch it. It's crazy. Oh, wow. And he ends up going into a pipe and the pipe tunnels through the earth and he pops out at the uh, at the rio olympics you know on stage <laughs> it was uh, is a quite a spectacle wow wow that's pretty yeah. good product placement it was you know and and i think huh? uh it got a lot of people really hyped for uh tokyo uh 2020 olympics they they did like have that kind of kerfuffle over their stock price like they came out and they're like uh, hey, we actually didn't make Pokemon Go, and then everyone's like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of that was kind of ridiculous." Yeah, I don't know why they decided to do that, but I'm not I'm not sure who to get upset about with that. It just seems like a really dumb scenario all around. Yeah, <laughs> like it yeah. feels like Nintendo shouldn't have said that, but it also feels like everybody sort Should've... of flew off the handle and panicked. That's, that happens with stocks a lot. Like it's very stocks are very emotional. Like it can, they can be based on nonsense whether they go up and down. Very volatile. Yeah. Oh wait, I have I have an early birthday present for you. A oh, song. A song. A song. You made me a song. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful song. Oh, I think it I think it accurately sums up our our friendship. That is very touching, Matthew. Our oh wait, how long have we been friends for? What twenty years? Uh, Eighteen years. I don't know. Seventh grade. We're old. It yep. it sums up all those years. So so how about you play it for our listeners now? Okay, here we go. One. Two, a buckle my shoe now. Go, oh, look at that big old fat pudgy hair. Look at that big old fat pudgy. Go, look at that big old fat pudgy hair. 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 Break it down now. Break it down. Look at that big old fat pudgy hair. 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 Look at that big old fat pudgy h
Yeah, <laughs> you need to play it at my funeral, dude. Yeah. Okay. You could. You could it'll be. A, it'll be a song about you at my funeral. <laughs> I like. I like how 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 chipper this conversation. Is. <laughs> I guess that's about it. So, smell your flip side. Yeah, smell your flip side, guys. My name is Matthew. I will eat your cashew. Don't throw me in the bathroom. Or I will have... Raffles. Ruffles. Raffles. Ruffles. No! Not to Skype! It burns! It burns! Alright, hang on. Let me move your head this way. This way.